Good afternoon, everyone. The Sacramento City Council will please come to order. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll so that we might establish a quorum? Mayor Pro Tem Ashby? Here. Council Member Warren? Here. Vice Mayor Harris? Here. Council Member Hansen? Here. Council Member Chenier? Here. Council Member Guetta? Here. Council Member Jennings? Here. Council Member Carr? Here. And Mayor Steinberg? Here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we, of course, have uh, a special meeting this afternoon at 1, a closed session at 3.30, and then a, a regular meeting of the City Council at 5 p.m. Um, we begin with a presentation this afternoon recognizing National Planning Month. I turn it over to Council Member Hansen uh, for the presentation. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, as you know, um, all great cities have great planning staff and do a lot of work to make sure that the built environment reflects the values of the community and continues to reinforce the positive parts of what we're trying to do. And in Sacramento, that has to do with um, supporting transit, uh, uh, fighting climate change, creating livable communities that are resilient and resource efficient. And um, in honor of that, uh, we're here today just to support our planning team um, who's done an excellent job and are currently underway with the general plan update as well as um, a lot of other projects across the city specific plans corridor improvements and specific projects as well and trying to match our aspirations to these projects and so i'll, I'll turn it over to the planning staff for their short video and i um, want to thank them Steve? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, uh, no disrespect intended at all, but I forgot the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So if we might uh, ask Mayor Pro Tem Ashby, who was kind enough to remind me, um, if, if we would get up and uh, anyone who can stand up, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Okay. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under god, god indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all, for all. good Thank so you. mayor just to close out that thought um i there's a great planning document in a book and it has a quote at the beginning to plan is human to implement divine and so as much as we plan to do the pledge of allegiance Thanks, thankful for the divine intervention of <laughs> Council Member Ashby to ensure that we did it. And so with that, I'll turn Thank it over you. to our planners. Absolutely. Continue, please. Uh, we're turning it over to the planning uh, team for a video. Oh, and just, uh, Mayor and Council Greg Salen, Acting Planning Director. We have Julia Lave Johnson, who's the president of the California uh, American Planning Association, just to pick up the video and make some introductory remarks. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Julia Lave Johnson and I am the president of the California chapter of the American Planning Association, the largest chapter in the nation. I wanna thank you for having me here today to celebrate October as National Community Planning Month. On behalf of Sacramento's professional planners, our community planners, both appointed and volunteers, I want to thank the city and its leadership for recognizing the important impact planning has on the social, economic and environmental health of the city and the lives of its community members. I personally want to thank the city and its community development department for their continued support and engagement with APA California Sacramento Valley section and our award-winning plan mentorship program, which is preparing the next generation of community leaders. I look forward to your continued partnership as we plan to make Sacramento an ever greater place to live, work, and play. And now in recognition of the other event in October, we have a real treat, a short video about planning in Sacramento. Thank you. I don't think the sound is working. Yeah, I. Where's the music? Um, Mindy, are you able to hear the sound in the chamber? No, we can't. 
Oh, Why don't we, um, okay. Can we... we take just a moment and see if we can figure out the technical problem. And if not, we'll uh, maybe play the video at the end of the meeting. Planning is important to Sacramento because Sacramento is both a diverse and very engaged city. Planning is how Sacramento works together to understand our various communities' needs and how best to balance competing objectives. I'm Tom Pace, and I'm the Director of Community Development for the City of Sacramento. For me, the Sacramento 2030 General Plan was that project a major change in the way the city went about planning for the future because it was a community driven plan that engaged the whole community and had huge amounts of participation from the public. One of my favorite projects I've worked on as a planner has been a comprehensively adjusting our parking requirements for new development. This really helped prioritize people, businesses, homes over cars. It really kicked off, um, this was in 2012, our city's uh, infill growth helped encourage development in Central City and along the coast. I really liked Grid 3.0, which was a transportation master plan developed for the Central City. Participants were excited to share their thoughts about changing the future around how people, goods, and services should move around downtown and midtown, recognizing that the area was a community and not just a destination for workers and entertainment. Currently working on a climate action plan and a general plan update that will help address climate change, create more resilient communities, incentivize new housing types, and encourage residents to walk and bike more, as well as creating an environmental justice element that will serve the needs of our underserved communities. One thing the city does is hold a city planning academy where interested community members can come and learn about all the different aspects of planning and how it works in our city. And that's a great resource for anyone who's interested in planning uh, the future growth of our city and bringing that back to their communities. Planning is the art of managing change. I enjoy being in a field where I can be a part of helping to chart the course of the future of my community. Hey, really well done. Really well done. Congratulations. Councilman Hansen. All right. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, thank you, uh, Tom, Greg, and the whole team. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in, but um, there's a lot to be done when it comes to good planning. And uh, I know Council Member Guerra is a forming County Planning Commissioner. Uh, Council Member Warren does a significant amount of planning in his professional life, and we all uh, derive benefits from this work. And so it's really an honor to recognize our staff and the work of our citizens in moving the city forward. That's it. That's it. No, a really very important part of our, of our city responsibilities um, and the general plan is a vision for what we want the city to look like over the next decade. And um, we have very creative and dedicated uh, planning and community development staff. And uh, I, I congrats on the recognition and thank you for bringing this forward today. Good.
Let us now move forward to the consent calendar. And um, uh, let's move on to the consent calendar. Are there any questions from members or any uh, items that members would like uh, removed from the consent calendar? And Mr. Mayor, I have three callers for public comment. Okay, there, uh, Madam Clerk, there is some feed, weird feedback going on here with the with the broadcast. I don't know what it is, if it's just my computer, but um, it's getting a lot of feedback. So. We'll work on that, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's hear from the three uh, members of the public who are calling on the consent calendar, please. Thank you, may I have my first caller, please? Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Thank you. My name is Daphne Harris, and I am um, thankful that the mayor and the council are allowing us to speak. I have three points of information. Um, the attachments are not available on agenda items one through 28. And as a member of the public, I'm asking that all agenda items are discussed individually and not passed as a general consent motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. This is Cornelius Burke with the North State BIA. I'm calling a strong support from item number 10 on your consent calendar, we think it's a smart and prudent move right now, given the, the COVID-19 crisis. It will help to rebound the Central City as we recover from COVID-19. Thank planning staff for their leadership on this analysis of this item. Obviously, I want to thank Council Enhancement for his leadership in the Central City, and thank all of the members of the City Council and you, Mayor, for your extraordinary leadership during this unprecedented time. Thank you so much, and please vote yes on item number 10. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius. One more person? Next caller, please. Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Yeah, uh, Richard Wake, City Council, District 5. So I'm calling in this afternoon. Uh, I see there's an item on the consent calendar for uh, for. Uh, issues regarding the homeless. And there's also one coming up for the meeting at five o'clock. So my question is the following. Uh, you know, th there's an ad being run by the campaign for strong mayor that says the mayor can declare an emergency uh, in regards to the homeless issue and then compares what happened in San Diego to what happened here. So I'm just wondering on um, if both are gonna be rounded up to pass uh, emergency measures on the homeless issue and any other things that could be happening relating to shelters, why is strong mayor even needed if six votes are gonna be acquired tonight to pass the emergency measures? I'll be, happy, I'll be happy to yield my time to anybody that cares to answer. Well, thank you very much for your call, Richard. Of course, the appropriate place to have a discussion about any measure on the ballot, including measure A, is outside the city council uh, chamber. So I know I would be happy to speak with you. I'm sure any other member would be uh, outside of an official city council meeting. It's not appropriate, frankly, to talk about the merits okay, or, well, or, or not of, okay, uh, of any particular measure. Well, 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 I hope something is done. Whatever it's done is soon, because I called in several weeks ago in regards to this, and we've been suffering down here in the Southland Park area for quite some time because of a, uh, of a homeless encampment that's up on the American River and a bunch of trailers that have been parked on Riverside Boulevard uh, for quite some time now. And, you know, I'm all for helping out the homeless people, as you all well know. I donate a lot of time and effort to help with this issue. Yet there's an increase in crime in our neighborhood, uh, vandalizing, breaking windows, all sorts of stuff. Thank you for your comments. Your time is complete. Will you make your final comment, please? Um, yeah, it's just kind of hypocritical 
to pass all this stuff now and do it now when we've been waiting three years and you guys are Thank out you for your comments. More power for the mayor. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have no more callers. Mayor, I'd like to move the consent calendar. Is there a second? I uh, know uh, Pro Tem Ashley, you have a comment. Sure, Mayor, I'm happy to second. I have a comment. I don't need to pull it, but item seven is uh, the contract for the janitorial services for City Hall. And I just, you know, this was long discussed, took us a couple of years, and I wanted to thank city staff for uh, working with me and being persistent and seeing it through. This is now just an item on our consent calendar easily. Uh, I'm sure we'll receive the support tonight, but it means a lot to the janitors in city hall because it now means that they don't have to choose between a dollar or $2 an hour of wages and healthcare. We changed the contract so that the janitors will have health care without being penalized in their hourly wages. And uh, it was a bit of a battle, but I am very grateful to city staff for hearing us out and seeing it through. And with that, I'm happy to second the motion made by Councilmember Hansen and go ahead and vote. Very much. Um, let's call the roll on the consent calendar, please. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Yes. Councilmember Warren. Yes. Vice Mayor Harris. Aye. Council Member Hansen. Aye. Council Member Chenier. Aye. Council Member Guetta. Aye. Council Member Jennings. Council Member Carr. Aye. And Mayor Steinberg. Aye. Did Council Member Jennings get to? Council Member Jennings is yes. Okay, good. Didn't want to leave you out. Very good. The consent calendar passes uh, <clears throat> unanimously. We do have two items on the discussion calendar. One is item 29. And why don't we begin with that, which is a uh, two audits that our city auditor performed. Let me turn it over to the city auditor, please. Can you hear me? Um, no, you're not on mute. So, what? Uh, there's a lot of like it's uh, real windy or something. But... Um, I'm not. Let's see if uh, we could hear you a little bit. You may try adjusting your volume, Jorge. This is Maria. Any better? Hello? Yes. I can hear you now. Okay. Go ahead. Why don't you give it a try? No, not hearing you very well. Can anybody else? Be the could be the headphones. Um, Jorge, try without the headphones, maybe. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, just one more thing to do to get the PowerPoint. You might just need to speak up. Uh, Mayor, I also uh, want to point out that the council does have to take a vote to suspend uh, having this go directly to budget and audit. Uh, Ma Madam City Attorney, do we, can we do that after the presentation? Um, I, I believe you have to do it now. Okay, well then let's do that and that'll give Jorge a little bit more time. Um, That's what I figured. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Good. This is to suspend the rule so that this can come directly to the city council. It should be non-controversial. Let's call the roll on 
on the motion, please. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Yes. Council Member Warren. Yes. Vice Mayor Harris. Aye. Council Member Hansen. Aye. Council Member Chenier. Aye. Council Member Guetta. Aye. Council Member Jennings. Hey, Rick. Council Member Carr. Yes. Council Member Jennings. Mayor Steinberg. Yes. Okay. The rule is suspended. Let's proceed now with the auditor's report, please. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Barely. Sorry about that. Please speak Good up. Good afternoon, right. Mayor and members of the City Council. Jorge Segueda, your City Auditor. More loud. With me today is Lynn Bashaw, Farishta Arari, and Nathan Lugo who were together uh, working on this project. The recommendation that is before you is that you pass a motion by two thirds vote, which we just did, uh, suspending um, the council rules and procedures. And then number two, approving the city auditor's contract compliance audit of the Roberts Family Development Center and Downtown Streets Team Incorporated. Am I coming through okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, the objective of the audit was to assess compliance with city contracts for two separate entities, the Roberts Family Development Center and Downtown Streets Team. The Roberts Family Development Center is a nonprofit entity that delivers programming to hundreds of low income at risk youth organizes pop-up events and operates freedom schools in the city of Sacramento. RFDC received approximately $1.2 million in grant funding from the city of Sacramento between 2016 and December of 2019. So why did we audit RFDC? In December of 2019, the city manager's office became aware that RFDC settled a lawsuit in August uh, of 2019 with the state of California Department of Housing and Community Development, in which the state alleged RFDC had mismanaged and diverted funds in relation to one of their contracts. The settlement agreement indicates that while neither the state nor RFDC admitted liability, RFDC agreed to repay the state $400,000 in damages. We had two findings related to the work with RFDC. The first finding is that RFDC's financial record keeping system is disorganized and contains significant material weaknesses. Covered in this finding is that is the issue that revenue and expenses are not adequately tracked to ensure uh, they are used for their intended purposes. It is questionable how RFDC will fund debt payments to the state that resulted from settlement agreements. $21,000 in loans were made to RFDC directors and officers in violation of the California Corporations Code and financial performance indicators suggest RFDC may be struggling to meet financial obligations. We had seven recommendations relating to finding one as noted on this page. They include developing processes to ensure revenues and expenses are coded to the correct accounts, documenting the specific source of funds for which the state debt will be paid, developing processes and procedures to continue to monitor clean key financial performance indicators. The second finding is that RFDC should develop a robust system of internal controls to safeguard charitable assets, prevent loss, and ensure the reliability of financial records. Included in this finding are issues related to a lack of financial reporting, fundraising, and volunteering policies, the RFDC board of directors uh, not exercising adequate fiscal operational oversight, 
stronger controls being needed over employee debit card use. Um, and RFDC was not in good standing with the California Attorney General's Registry of Char Charitable Trusts during part of the audit. They are currently in good standing. In relationship to finding two, we had six recommendations in this finding. They include establishing a finance committee requiring all employees to complete RFDC's monthly debit forms and submit receipts and discontinuing the use of employee debit cards. We should also note that in June of 2020, RFDC entered into an agreement with the Sierra Health Foundation, whereby the Sierra Health Foundation will provide certain advisory and consulting services to RFDC, as noted on this slide. Uh, included in that agreement are um, uh, the contract states that an independent assessment of RFDC's operational and organizational needs will be conducted. Also a review of RFDC's governance structure and policies and procedures. There are many other uh, areas where uh, the Sierra Health Foundation will be providing assistance and those are detailed in the contract. The report's second chapter focuses on downtown streets team, which engages and organizes team members who provide cleanup and beautification services to various cities. Why did we audit uh, downtown streets team? We audited downtown streets team at the request of the city manager to look into allegations that former employees had been subjected to discrimination and a toxic workplace culture and to evaluate their compliance with the city's contract. We had two findings regarding the downtown streets team. Our first finding is that the downtown streets team's human resource policies and internal complaint procedures should be updated to reflect best practices and communicated to all employees annually. Included in this finding is that 40% um, of employees sampled have not formally acknowledged downtown streets team human resources policies in years. In the first finding, we made four recommendations, which included developing a process to ensure all employees, including management, acknowledge the employee handbook annually. The second finding is that gift cards meant for homeless persons were signed for by downtown streets team staff. We had one recommendation related to this finding, which was to develop a process to ensure gift card receipts are acknowledged by volunteers and not downtown street team employees. So what about the city's grant management practices? We found the city could improve its grant management practices by adopting best practices uh, as noted in the report. Specifically, we found a centralized process for receiving grant applications and aggregating funding data could improve the city's grant management practices, a lack of an evaluation process to determine if grantees have sufficient technical capacity to demonstrate performance. And finding three is insufficient monitoring of financial reporting and program results compromises the city's ability to ensure contract terms are met and objectives are achieved. In regards to recommendations to city management, we made four recommendations to address the three findings in the third chapter, which included establishing a citywide grants management policies based on industry best practices that include guidance on due diligence, contract compliance, financial reporting and program evaluation. That concludes my presentation. I believe there are representatives from the Roberts Family Development Center and the Downtown Streets team, if there are any questions regarding the content of the report. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mr. C. Auditor. Um, so I, I know we've got public testimony, but is it appropriate now, I think to have the subjects of both the audits uh, present. Um, and then if there are other members of the public who want to testify, that's of course appropriate. And then 
uh, we'll turn it over to the council for questions and, and comments. So why don't we begin with the representatives of the Roberts Family Development Center to provide a response uh, to the audit. Who is, is that? Is that Daryl or Tina or, or a representative of the, another representative of the, of the center? It would be Daryl and Tina Roberts, Mayor. Okay, um, we don't have you on video. Uh, and we'd love to see you if we could, but- Yes, sir, whatever. not sure what the problem is. Uh, host has asked you to start your video, okay? There you go. Now we see you. Okay. Oh. Well, welcome, Carol. Good afternoon, Mayor Steinberg, uh, Ch uh, City Manager Chan, members of the City Council. It's Daryl and Tina Roberts, co founders of Roberts Family Development Center and the chief officers of this center. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to address the City, city Auditor's report on our fiscal reporting process. Uh, thank the City Auditor and the staff for working with us during the last nine months. And as we have stated in the report, we recognize our failure to address the fiscal house of our organization. And we are addressing it with the energy, optimism, and vigor that we have addressed the programmatic side of our center. In addition to assign, uh, uh, signing an MOU partnership with Sarah Health Foundation early this summer to help us account for our future city financial support, we have hired Colleen Craig, a 20 year veteran of, in nonprofit accounting as our fiscal director to assure we are in compliance with all standards and procedures required by the IRS, Attorney General, Charitable Trust, and the city and county of Sacramento. It should be noted that Ms. Craig comes to us through our Sierra Health Partnership, but it is our plan to keep her on as a part of the Roberts family for a very long time. Tina. Good afternoon. In addition to our partnership with Sierra Health, in addition, our partnership with Sierra Health will help strengthen our board of directors governing structure. The work has also started with board governance training provided by Gilbert and Associates and the active recruitment of new committed board members to join our existing board. We have also elected a new board chair, Marty Bray, who has committed to leading us in a strong new direction one that will bring new and much needed unrestricted financial support to our organization. It is no secret, like many nonprofits, we are challenged to bring in non-program support, but our new revitalized board, which will be expanding, has expressed a willingness to do just that. City Council, when we started RFDC 20 years ago, uh, we had no idea the positive impact we would have on the lives of children and families we served. From preschool support to the, to the thousands of grade schoolers tutoring and assisting high schoolers being ment mentored to the hundreds of college students we have seen graduate as part of the Roberts family, we are proud of our work but recognize that we are no longer the small nonprofit with the purpose of helping families, but now we are an organization employing nearly 100 staff members annually, serving more than 600 youth and their families yearly with an annual budget in excess of $2.5 million each year with the desire to make systematic change. COVID has given us the opportunity to serve our neighbors and neighborhoods in ways we never thought possible. Feeding families, providing PPE, and being ready to provide emergency support in the toughest moments has become part of our daily work. By focusing on our services to the community, we have become a trusted community partner. By focusing on our fiscal structure, we will become that institution which can stand the test of time. Our hope is to leave a legacy others can follow. We hope to return periodically to give you a public update on what's happening with Roberts Family Development Center and to reinsure you and to gain the trust of those that we have lost on the council and our city who, that have had for us in meeting our expectations. Allow me to introduce our partner in this new venture, uh, Mr. Richard Dana, Senior, Pro Senior Program Officer of Sierra Health, who will speak more to the relationship and partnership we now have, have established. And that'll be followed by our, our board chair, Lonnie Bray, who will offer a few comments himself. Mr. Dana. 
Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, uh, Richard Dana, Director of Community and Economic Development for the Sierra Health Foundation. Um, you know, I want to start by actually just thanking Jorge and his team for the work that they did. In particular, when I met with him, his push was around the value of the work that is being done on the ground level and how we maintain that. Uh, I think we found some opportunities to uh, not just ensure that there's continuation long term, but that they're strengthening at the same time. So appreciation to his team for that. Uh, Mr. Roberts mentioned the agreement between Sierra Health Foundation and Roberts Family Development Center. That agreement calls for Sierra Health Foundation to manage RFDC's financial operations to ensure compliance with the industry accepted accounting practices, grant reporting, um, the implementation of financial management tools and systems. And Ms. Roberts mentioned as well that we're doing uh, some additional board training and some fiscal oversight with the board to ensure that reporting um, and oversight can be maintained long-term. I also want to just quickly note that um, in Jorge's presentation, he noted the cost of Sierra Health Foundation taking the fiscal management on. I just want to point out that the 120,000 is being spent on a fiscal manager, a person who is hired by Sierra Health Foundation to oversee the Robert Family Development Center's operations. It's a really standard cost in today's world, um, especially in the nonprofit world, where it's really important that the financial capacity of an organization be strengthened. Mo many nonprofits actually do that through outside entities. I know from my experience with Mutual Assistance Network as the executive director for 20 years, we use an outside entity to oversee our accounting. That allows for um, non-biased oversight and a third party eye, which really is important in today's world. So that cost 120 is very standard. And if it wasn't going to us, it would be part of his, the RFDC's built-in system of management internally. Um, just wanted to note that. Really proud of the work that's being done in strengthening together through the partnership between the city, RFDC, and Sierra Health Foundation. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Mr. Bray, uh, would you like to make a couple comments as board chair? Yes, I would. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity uh, to collectively uh, go over the uh, response to the audit report. Um, as, the new, as the new board chair, I take responsibility responding to the uh, findings seriously. Uh, this response is critical to the future success of RFDC. RFDC excuse me. Um, I am committed to ensure RFDC adopts the best practices to address all of the audit filings. A brief update, thus far we have partnered with the Sierra Health Foundation and instituted board governance training. Uh, we had two sessions thus far on August 12th and August 20th. Uh, the focus for those initiatives were board governance and fundraising. In reference to board governance, uh, we discussed the board's roles and responsibilities we talked about establishing a constructive partnership between the board and the executive directors. Uh, we instituted a new board structure meeting uh, format to ensure that we have more formalized notes and uh, documentation of what our progress in the meetings have been. Uh, we also talked about strengthening the board membership while enhancing the talent pool to represent, represent the diverse competencies that we need, i.e. law, finance, retail, uh, fundraising, nonprofit, et cetera. We also uh, uh, made a commitment to increase the board members to a minimum of 10 members, not including the executive directors. Uh, in reference to fundraising, uh, we already talked about um, getting the, uh, the fundraising aligned with the disciplines along with the RFTC prior, uh, priorities in reference to making sure that we have people on the board that understand finance, understand uh, fundraising, understand how the nonprofit system works to assist us with our financial endeavors. Um, also the board members, we are also looking at um, improving our own personal ability through to, to secure non-restricted funds to what we call a give or get commitment. The amount of that give or get commitment will be uh, put, up or put up on the board for approval. Uh, these monies that we secure with the give or get program will utilize to assist with the one-time onus settlement payment 
uh, responsibility of $180,000. Uh, conjunctively, throughout the year, we will continue to conduct various fundraising activities to generate unrestricted funding, i.e. golf tournaments, uh, virtual dinners, et cetera, to make sure that we can continue uh, to offset the ONS settlement responsibility. So in closing, thank you for the opportunity to speak about how our board will address the audit findings. And I look forward to communicating as to how our progress goes thus far. Thank you. And, and just so you know, Mayor, the um, Colleen Craig, who is our new fiscal director, she's on the line in case there are any other questions that are, uh, are requested of us. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I think we now wanna hear from the representative of Safe Street. They were also uh, part of the audit presentation. And then we will hear from the public. And then again, we'll go back right back to the city council. I see council members Chenier, Hanson and Warren who have uh, their hands up and I'm sure um, other members, I know I wanna make some comments. So <clears throat> let's hear from uh, whoever is here representing Safe Streets, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Rachel Davidson with Downtown Streets team. I am the Sacramento Area Director and uh, pleased for the opportunity to respond to the audit findings with all of you. I wanted to share a little bit about the history of how this audit uh, came to be. Almost three years ago, a small group of former employees filed a complaint, um, an HR complaint. At that point, our board of directors uh, hired an independent firm to conduct what became a year and a half long investigation. Uh, part of the agreement of, um, of the outcome of this was that whatever the outcome was, no additional um, judicial action would be taken by the former employees. After a year and a half long in independent investigation, it was found that the allegations were unsubstantiated and it was dropped. Um, once that happened, this group of former employees decided to um, go about having an article or a series of articles released. Um, and that's how we've come to this point here. All of the allegations we've taken very seriously as well as the findings. So first I want to address the findings that were outlined in the audit presentation. Um, in regards to our HR uh, program and resources. We have hired an HR director who now reports directly to our board. Uh, in addition to that, the employee handbook and manual was completely redone um, after the audit from the city of Sacramento and was redistributed to staff. Um, so every staff is signed within the last three weeks, a new employee handbook, which outlines their HR procedures and policies. Um, and that will be done every year moving forward. In regards to the gift cards and staff signing out, that was something that came to light um, because of this audit and I'm grateful for it. There was a staff person who encountered consistent technical difficulties at our Wednesday meeting. And so once a team member was handed their stipend, if our iPad was not working and did not capture the signature, that signature was then from a staff person later on that day when we had consistent connection to Wi-Fi. Uh, that happened for three months. And once it was brought to my attention, it was immediately stopped. We do have a firm policy uh, that team members must sign when they receive their gift cards. We do have um, hard copy paper documentation in the chance that we ever do again encounter technical difficulties. We have very uh, inconsistent access to Wi-Fi at our meeting location. So it does make it quite difficult for us from time to time. The only other time that happens is if a team member is in a situation where for some reason they are unable to sign and we receive a written consent from them to sign on their behalf as they receive their gift cards. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that the council has. We really look forward to being able to put this behind us to um, move forward and continue to do the good work that we're proud to do in the city of Sacramento, as well as in all of our 15 communities um, and any other findings and recommendations that the city has in the future, we are more than happy to implement immediately. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, all right, let us now move to uh, the public testimony other than um, the representative of the two organizations. How many, people do we have on the line, Madam Clerk? 
I have one caller on the line. Okay, let's take that caller, please. Thank you. May I have my caller, please? Welcome to the meeting. You have two minutes to address the council. Uh, yes, hello, Mayor Steinberg and members of the City Council. This is Jim Teddy. I'm the Executive Director of Youth Forward. And I'm here to speak in support of the Roberts Family Development Center. For over 15 years, I've personally witnessed the outstanding work of RFDC with children, youth, and families. Thousands of children and young people have benefited from their support in the areas of mentoring, job training, and employment skills, after school support, parent education, and other service areas. I think it's also important to note that RFDC works in our neighborhoods that have been most impacted by underinvestment, overcriminalization, and systemic racism. Each year, they build upon their legacy as young people graduate from their programs and go on to college and career and to continue to serve others. In my view, it's impossible to quantify the long-term positive impact of the Roberts Family Development Center. It is a critical asset here in our community. And as you've seen in the recent report, they have taken important steps forward to strengthen their internal infrastructure and to comply with the concerns expressed in the audit report. And then finally, I'd, I'd like to remark on the city's um, rec the recommendations the city brought forward to itself around developing an internal grant making system. I think it's important for the city to not only look at compliance uh, with the nonprofit sector, but also find ways to support capacity building uh, in our sector. Um, the nonprofits are a critical element here, particularly as the city seeks to do more in the area of racial equity. Um, for the last few years, I've been working with three state agencies to help them develop uh, grant-making programs. These are agencies that are making grants uh, uh, that are funded by state cannabis tax revenues. We sought uh, feedback uh, from nonprofits around the state and developed recommendations on how these state agencies can best work with... Uh, Thank you for your comments. Your time is complete. Will you make your final comment, please? Yeah, my final comment is that as the city goes to develop its uh, grant-making system, I would strongly encourage city staff to work in dialogue with nonprofits and uh, develop something that works both for the city and for the nonprofit. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have no more callers. Okay, let's turn it over to uh, the city council. I've got uh, council member Chenier, Hanson Warren, and Vice Mayor Harris. So, Councilman Chenier. Thank you, Mayor. Um, First of all, I want to thank Jorge and his staff for undertaking this. I think this is really a uh, critical piece of it, pieces of information that we've gotten. Um, also, at the outset, I want to thank Sierra Health for kind of stepping in and supporting uh, Daryl and Tina and the, the very important work that they do. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of nonprofits. So we, we have two organizations here that are really critical to the future of the city that do fabulous work in the neighborhoods and that I know uh, are important to us as we think about the future of Sacramento. What this has pointed up though, which I don't think is unique is the lack of capacity. And I'm gonna echo a few things that Jim Keddy said, but the lack of capacity among nonprofits, particularly nonprofits that started very small and have grown quickly. Um, Generally, they're underfunded and generally they're trying to make it through the day. So when you have reporting requirements and trying to create infrastructure, I think that's often difficult for them to do because of a lack of resources. And I think we have two pretty good examples of, of what can happen when you have good people doing good work, um, but not having the capacity and the resources to kind of round that out 100% um, to be able to take care of all of the bits and pieces that, that one has to do when you run an organization. Um, I've known uh, uh, the Roberts for since, since her days at uh, Keith B. Kenny Elementary School and the Head Start program there. Uh, and I've been familiar with Downtown Streets now for uh, a couple of years through other work that I do as well. And they both do sterling work. There's no question about it. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, as we have stepped up our capacity as a city to provide technical assistance to small businesses, we should be doing the same thing for nonprofits. As we think about the future, as we think about 
um, the, the work that we want to do around inclusive economic development, we're going to need these nonprofits as partners. Uh, I've talked about this before in, in statements, but they are closer to the ground. They understand the neighborhoods in which they work. And I think we need to really understand and rely on them to help us get where we want to go as a community and as a city. So my hope is twofold. One is, um, and I believe uh, city attorney, we, we still need a motion to accept the, the compliance audits. Is that correct? That's correct, council member. Okay, so I, well, I wanna do two things. I wanna move that we accept the audits by the, by, uh, the audit, city auditor. I think they were done really well and have highlighted something that we need to get at. Um, I also wanna provide direction to the city manager to look at the city's recommendations, but also to think about how we can parallel what we're doing for small businesses or nonprofits and capacity building and come back to the council with an outline of what we can be doing, whether it's this year or within next year's budget. So that's my motion and direction. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chenier. Uh, Councilmember Warren was next, uh, then <coughs> thank Harris, then Carr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll second uh, Jay's motion. Um, you know, I think Jay touched on some very valid points that, you know, when you go from a small enterprise to a much larger enterprise, you're faced with challenges that sometimes you're unprepared for. And uh, I think all of us recognize the good work that Daryl and Tina are doing uh, throughout the city of Sacramento and have been doing it for a long time. So it takes special people to stay committed to doing the kinds of things that they've been doing. And so, and I know that uh, uh, Sierra Health Foundation will be an added uh, security uh, blanket, if you will, to really help them stabilize their, their enterprise. Um, I also know that uh, this uh, COVID situation and the economic, not collapse, but, the economic challenges uh, that it has brought about is really uh, traumatic uh, across the board. And so a lot of people are feeling it. And, and I know that uh, uh, Robert's Family Development Center has a, a project, a very significant project under construction. And so hopefully as we get through this, we can find our way uh, clear to help support them. There are long ways uh, along in the process but they do need some additional support and I'd be supportive of helping them get what they need to finish their project. So keep up the good work, Daryl and Tina. Uh, and thank you for what you're doing in the city and in district two. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Councilman. Councilmember Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Jorge, um, for your team's hard work. I don't think anybody looks forward to an audit. It's sort of like anticipating a colonoscopy organizationally. And, um, you know, without the forgetful drug they give you so you don't remember what happened. Uh, I think that um, having served on a lot of nonprofit boards and engaged with a, non a, lot, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of them are thinly resourced when it comes to administrative capacity because donors and grantors, they don't wanna fund overhead or back of house operations. They just wanna fund service delivery. And what we're seeing here is something that I would expect if we audited in the same way, every nonprofit that we support, we would find similar deficiencies probably across the board in some process or procedure. That doesn't mean that um, the organizations can't do better now that they know better, to paraphrase Maya Angelou. And I was very proud to see the um, forthright response that both agencies had. Um, in, in the midst of this COVID pandemic, We've come to rely on nonprofits even more to be extra responsive, to go above and beyond, to stretch even further. Um, these two organizations in particular serve communities that are um, some of the most disadvantaged, left behind, forgotten, in need, fallen through the cracks of government and need the helping hand of a friendly face and a loving hug to find their way back to us. And you know, I, I think in the end, when you hear about Mr. Roberts or Miss Roberts, as we call them, Daryl and Tina, and their work in the community, the smiles on the kids, the results with the parents, 
um, speak volumes about, you know, their legacy and how much they really do care about the communities they serve. And whether it's uh, been in my district, which um, they've done tremendous work uh, through the Roberts Family Development Center, um, particularly with um, our public housing sites at Marina Vista and Alder Grove through College Bound Babies or Freedom Schools or the Black Child Legacy Program. There has really been a tremendous value to their on the ground presence. And I'll note, um, as they've been cut back in that particular community, we've seen the rise of violence and trauma without the, the, the corollary opportunity um, to get with those families and help to, to repair some of that damage and get people back to where they need to be. For Downtown Streets team, uh, you know, it is a truly transformational program. Earlier this year, right before the pandemic hit, um, the Broadway team, um, which had just been merged with some folks who had been working downtown, um, we, uh, I took everyone to breakfast at Pancake Circus. And we had uh, brown sugar and the whole crew. And um, I, I don't need to bore you with photos, but if you saw the, the feelings of um, uh, dignity and respect that people get from a program that empowers them, um, especially when you're homeless and you don't have resources and you know um, everybody thinks that you're gonna just fail so they've given up on you. Um, Rachel and her team just have not given up. They did a celebration earlier this year for their participants. They did a DJ at the um, Sacramento Food Bank and Rachel and her team, I got to stop by dancing with the participants. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to get together to have a celebration but how many of you have taken the time to dance with somebody who's homeless? How many of you have taken the time to go listen to their stories? I, I actually, uh, I didn't have to twist his arm, he offered to do it, but Howard Chan, our city manager, went to see one of their weekly team meetings. And um, I know that the formalities of signing for this and that are really important. I don't wanna diminish that, but these programs in the amount of reliance that we have on them for, um, the great expectations to meet needs for the responsibilities that we've foisted upon them. A lot of times they just don't get the resources that the people in need truly deserve. And so um, I know that, um, while this wasn't fun, I'm glad that it's over. I'm glad that we've been able to provide value to the board, staff and leadership at both organizations. And I do think that's the value of an audit. Although again, it's probably one of the least desirable things that you wanna do, especially an audit in, in public. Um, I don't think anybody gets their colonoscopies in public, um, but I, I do think this is really important. I wanna support the motion, but I'd, I'd like to add a little direction, Jay and Alan, which is um, we funded through Measure U last year, monies to help the Roberts Family Development Center finish out their building project. I'd like to add direction to have the city manager agendize that for our November 10th meeting to provide those monies through Sierra Health Foundation to complete the building project so the Roberts Family Development Center can get back up on their feet, continue to provide the great services. And I know through this pandemic, it's not only PP, P and P, PPE, it's also food, it's also a variety of other things that no government agency can do very well or as efficiently. And so um, I, I hope that uh, Jay, you can take that as additional direction and Alan, you'll, you'll accept that as the second. So the, the direction is to agendize the item? Yes, agendize the item for the council to award um, the, the grants that's been um, held back due to the audit. And we can vote on that at that meeting. Okay, I just wanna give the city manager um, along with the mayor, the flexibility on timing on that, but I'm happy to ask them to agendize it as, as soon as possible. Uh, Mr. City Manager, is there a date that you would prefer? Um, how about we come back to this after the council come uh, on, a, on a date, in case there are any other things that needed to be added to this, uh, this motion. Okay, well, I would just ask before the uh, Thanksgiving holiday that we have this back. We've got two meetings, the 10th and the 17th, and one of those as direction to the city manager. Okay. I, I'm going to make Jay. a comment on. I'm going to make a comment on on your suggestion when it comes to me around the timing and how we do this. But thank you, um, Councilman Chenier's 
so Jay, you're not at this point, you just rather wait on the friendly amendment. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to provide the direction to bring it back to council. I'd like to see what the city manager and the mayor have as far as timing. That's all. Okay. And Alan, are you willing to support that as the second? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay. We've got, um, Vice Mayor Harris, then Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. I see hands up and Councilmember Geta. Okay, let's go, uh, Jeff. Thank you, Mayor. You know, dear Alentina, a lot has been said about what you provide to the community and I agree with that. I've gone to see your programs and uh, really appreciated the work that you do in the community and specifically the employees that you've hired who are very dedicated to uplifting youth and underserved communities. There's, there's no disputing that. Uh, you know, that's why I'm deeply disappointed at this audit that you find yourself in such a pickle. You know, it's not uh, a lightweight thing that the state came down on you and came down pretty hard and that you entered into a very substantial settlement. This audit was exhaustive and turned up many factors in the lack of transparency in your reporting and your receipts that leave open to question a lot about your financial future. I'd like to say that I really hope that you overcome these obstacles and appreciate that you're gonna work with Sierra Health, but there's two outstanding issues here that are very important to, to look at. One is that our auditor was not able to ascertain how or where from you pay your payments to the state, nor how you will get the $10,000 monthly to pay Sierra Health. So there are a lot of issues here. Um, you know, how you got yourself into this financial bind is, is uh, you know, I suppose that question, but it's immaterial. What matters is moving forward. And uh, like I said, I really hope, given the fact that you have done and can do, and perhaps will do an awful lot more for the community, that you put your fiscal house in order. But it's very important, I think, for this council to understand the gravity of the situation here. I mean, this is pretty serious stuff we're looking at. and. I would be happy to vote for funding for you in the future once we understand how you're paying your state debt and how you are able to pay Sierra Health to, to work out these issues. But there are still a lot of questions in play here. You know, ultimately, I don't have to go on too long about this, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a small businessman. And as a business person, if my books weren't auditable, auditable and acceptable, I would be out of business. The CSLB would revoke my contractor's license. You know, there are immediate repercussions to doing business poorly when you are in private business. And the same is true of nonprofits. So I've heard my colleagues talk about how you built up from a very small beginning to you know, a substantial organization. And yeah, I get it that books can kind of you know, not be at the forefront. But the fact of the matter is for any economic enterprise, it has to be at the forefront. You have to be able to be transparent, to show where the money comes from and where the money goes to. It's just part of being a responsible organization. So, you know, I, I personally do not think it's appropriate for the city to fund you any further until such a time as you can get a clean bill of health from our city auditor because he and his team are very thorough. I found them to be very fair, but mostly they're just spot on in terms of discovering the facts and reporting the facts. I don't know, Mr. City Manager, if you agree with me on that score, but you know, we have discussed this issue. And if I was in business and I had questionable books, I wouldn't be looking for funding until I could show the people funding me that I can account for every penny. Mr. Manager? So, uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, may I? You may, you might wanna to wait to the end of the council comments, but it's up to you, Mr. City Manager, if you wanna respond. No, no, I'll, I'll defer to the council. 
I'll defer the council. Well, that's fine. So, so I've said my piece, you yeah. know, I, I, I really hope that you can find the money to work with Sierra Health, that you can get the financial expertise on board that you need, that your board will be more proactive and they will basically hold your feet to the fire. You know, you need help to work on the finances so you can do the work that you do and do very well. And uh, I, I, again, uh, encourage you and hope that you can pull, you know, out of this particular predicament and get back to the work of supporting the community that you've done for many years. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Carr, you were next, then Council Member Geta, then Council Member Ashby. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I am very much interested in hearing the answers to the questions posed by Vice Mayor. Uh, and I think those are critical things. But two things jump out at me uh, about the audit. One, uh, and I think Jay summarized them succinctly, uh, we probably need to think about how we can technically support the, um, the nonprofits that we give grants to. And there are organizations out there, I'm sure some of the chambers that already exist can do that. Uh, but the second thing that really jumps out, and Jay mentioned this, but I want to reiterate it, is that we don't have the capacity ourselves to monitor the grants that we are um, giving these nonprofits. We don't have the capacity to see if the grants really do deliver the results that we are hoping for in the contracts. And we don't have the capacity to see if the nonprofits are double dipping and uh, getting us to pay for uh, a service and getting another agency to pay for that same service. So I'd be interested in that. Chair, I think you included this in your motion that the city manager come back to us uh, with his um, take on the recommendations and what he plans to do about them. Is that included? Yeah, in yeah. yeah. I, I think we have a lot of work to do in grants management. It's not something the city has done historically very well. Um, but we've learned a lot of lessons over the last couple of years as we've, as we've increased our participation and work with nonprofits. But I think we have a ways to go. So I'd like the city manager to look at this pretty comprehensively, um, look at the recommendations from the auditor, and also look at the capacity building, both in the nonprofits and, and in the city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm learning how to do the waved hands on Zoom here. So now I see the order in a different way. I did before, and I guess it was Councilmember Jennings who was next, then Yetta, then Ashby, and then Steinberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I too want to thank Jorge and his staff on the audit and the work that they've done, um, invaluable work, and I appreciate it very much. Um, I know the um, motion on the floor has already been seconded but I would like to third that motion if it's possible just to show my support for it. And I guess I will when I vote. But the thing I think I wanna say most about the Roberts Family Development Center, and I wanna to speak to Daryl and to Tina, they are good people who do good quality work. And as a person who has run a nonprofit since 1992, and you can do the math, Building up to capacity in order to meet the needs that you have to run that business while you continue to do good work in the neighborhood and affecting each of the people becomes a difficult formula to put together. It's a very difficult formula to have a development director, to have a chief financial officer, to have all the components that are necessary to run a good quality organization. And oh, by the way, nobody's giving you any money in order to help pay for those positions. And so unless you have an incredible fundraiser that raises thousands of dollars or you have a philanthropist who just gives you money, sometimes you have to double up and the person who's running your child care center is the same person who maybe is doing another job as well. So I would ask every city council member who's sitting on the city council, how valuable are the nonprofits that are in your district, are they to you? And what kind of work are they doing that's making a difference in your district and in your community? I would ask you to ask every individual who goes to those nonprofits, how valuable are the nonprofits in the community who are doing the work 
that nobody else is doing that needs to be done. Every individual will tell you the one reason they go to the nonprofits is because they're there every single day fighting the fight to help make things come together and that they trust the people who are in the nonprofit. They may not trust government, but they trust the people who are out there doing the work in those nonprofits. And they trust Robert's Family Development Center. They trust Daryl and they trust Tina and they trust their entire staff. If you go and talk to the employees at Robert's Family Development Center, you have to ask how many of them, this was their first job that they got and the opportunity to work and to be able to walk from their home to their job so that they didn't have to worry about transportation. And how many people have they employed through the years you would see those numbers to be countless and just incredible. They provide incredible resources, not only to North Sacramento, but the entire city of Sacramento. Their nonprofit rating is 4.4. Obviously, they are doing something right. They run a freedom school. They run the Black Child Legacy. They run the teen scene. They run after school programs. They, move, they run Pacers moving forward and they do a parent impairment program. I can't even name everything that they do. I'm just telling you what I know. And so they impact and affect thousands of people every single day. And so now that they understand what they have to do, there is no question in my mind that they will meet the challenge. They've already brought in the Sierra Health Foundation. They've already addressed the board training that needs to be done. I know they're gonna start looking for ways to bring in the positions that they don't have in order to be able to run the organization the way it should be run and try to find out ways to raise money in order to pay for all of that. And so, you know, I'm sure they have all the questions to all the answers that we have right now. I'm sure they do. But I just want them to know from me, I have full confidence in Daryl Roberts, Tina Roberts, and the Roberts Family Development Center and what you can't figure out by yourself, we will put a team around you to give you the assistance that you need to continue the work that you're doing. So I don't condone what's happened, but I do know that you're a valuable resource that we will not let, we will not lose in the city of Sacramento. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Jennings. Councilmember Guetta. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, uh, Councilmember Jennings could not have said it more eloquent uh, thank you, uh, Tina, and thank you, uh, Daryl, and the Roberts Family Development Center for the, the work that you've done over the years. Um, thank you, Jorge, and the staff for uh, a, a thorough audit and, uh, and also the, the guidance and recommendations moving forward. Uh, I, again, you know, I think the, the key thing here I, I'd like to go back to is, uh, you know, for many of us who either served on nonprofit boards continue to support them, raise money for them and work with them. The folks who've created these nonprofits or started on, on them, they, they did it not to build a business, but they did it to solve a, an issue that was lacking, that they were filling a gap that had not been met. And many of our boards, uh, board members who are engaged in those also join for those issues in those social causes. The, you know, the, the boards that have gone through the, the tough times, they've kind of developed and, and had to, and have resolved some of these issues uh, and learned those experiences. Uh, they also happen to be the ones that have more, you know, wealthier donors. And so I think there's an equity question also sometimes about, you know, where we put, where we put our resources for nonprofits. Uh, I, I want to take a, a step back and also remind that when the city has gone out to do outreach for a number of our efforts, whether it's been our plan, general plan, whether it's been infrastructure projects, whether it's been information about how we're going to budget our city. The first thing that our city staff do is they reach out to those nonprofits, whether it's our not neighborhood associations, whether it's our uh, 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 the American Job Centers who are nonprofits, whether it's those who are uh, civic or religious organizations, the first people we go to is those for uh, support and help. And if there's anything that we continue to talk about is how do we do more community engagement and capacity building? Well, if we don't support the capacity building of those nonprofits, I think we're only doing us a disservice as well. So 
I mean, I, I want to support the motion. I'm going to support the motion and I also agree with the need to, as we move forward, I'd like the city and Mr. City Manager, I'd like the city to start looking at as part of our neighborhood services. How do we expand on also the, the education and training for our nonprofits? And it's not the first time we've, you know, uh, some of our nonprofits have, have forgotten to do the, the, the paperwork, particularly those at the very neighborhood level um, who we rely on. And I, I think ensuring that, uh, that we give some training, whether it's been through our chambers or, or, uh, or through other nonprofits who are experts and have gone through this, you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, I think is a key thing, but we do need to support that effort. Again, I wanna just thank again, all the work that's been done on this. It only highlights that there's more capacity building to do. And if I think about the last few months, it's been all the food distribution sites. It's been the flu vaccination um, uh, clinics that we're setting up. It's been the testing sites of, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and it's been also the employment centers where we're trying to get information about how to uh, recover during this COVID-19 have been at locations for nonprofits. So I wanna make sure that we look at increasing the capacity because it's, uh, I think as uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, uh, all of them are facing that same challenge and figuring out how we help in that, uh, that, that strengthening of that framework is important. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. And again, thank you all of those who put the, uh, this work together on, uh, on uh, how we better look at our uh, contract procurement. Thank you very much, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Thanks, Mayor. So first, Jay, are, is Jay still up there somewhere? I'm here. Jay, can, there was just a lot of bouncing around. Can you tell me what your motion is again? So the, the motion is twofold. One is to accept the audits, the compliance audits from the city auditor, which we need to do, and then provide direction to the city manager uh, to take a look at, number one, the recommendations that have come from the city auditor and respond to those, but also to look at the other side of that coin and the capacity building needs of nonprofits um, and of the city and to develop a plan to, uh, to get after that, possibly this year, but, po but for sure, at least in, in next year's budget. Um, my, my reasoning, you know, we've, we've worked a lot with small businesses to provide technical assistance. Um, I think we should be doing the same thing for nonprofits because of their importance to the city. So I completely agree on the nonprofits. I assume you mean like all nonprofits that we work with, right? Yeah, and we've, there's actually been a, a fair amount of work in the city around the capacity of nonprofits and what they're doing. I think we can be a lot better if mm -hmm. we're, we're more effective and efficient in how we work with them and how they work with each other, frankly. Okay, but as to the, this audit piece, you're just accepting the audit and then asking the city manager to look at the recommendations that that's it as to this audit and as to downtown street teams and uh, Roberts Correct. Family Community Centers. Correct, and then Steve's, Steve's friendly amendment of uh, agendizing R Roberts, the, the issue um, that we, we put aside for quite a while around the, the building itself. Yeah, so my question around is, so is that in your motion or is that out of your motion? It's part, of the, direct, it's part of the direction for the city manager to agendize that. We didn't put a date on it. Um, it's, not, it's not a motion to fund or, de, or not fund at this point, but to put it on the council's agenda. Okay, thank you, Jay. So here's, you know, kind of where I'm at. We, there are, it's, it's really true, the things that Rick and others have said about the Roberts family, they stand in a gap in a unique way, especially I think in district two, and they have a unique relationship out there. I know some of their uh, current and former employees really well. I went to school with some of them. And, uh, and I think it's important work. That being said, our job is, in large part fiscal responsibility for the city's dollars and they're limited. They're so, so limited. And there are so many nonprofits that we wanna help. And Jeff is right. We can't, we can't give them additional funding until we know that they have taken care of the things that Jorge has identified. I think it's irresponsible to put a spending item forward before we give them the opportunity 
to cure the problems that have been identified. They need to be able to tell us how they can pay their debt. They need to be able to show us how Sierra Health Foundation is working out for them. Kudos to them, you know, to stand up here at a council meeting with their heads held high and say, hey, we're going after this, we're gonna fix it. But we have to give them the opportunity to do it. Just saying that, that they're prepared to do it isn't enough for us to then extend more funding yet. We need to give them the chance to show us that they have made those changes. There are nonprofits all over the city of Sacramento asking us for funding for buildings, asking us for funding for programs. We know this, we all get the calls all the time. And while I think the Roberts family does extremely important work, I will be thrilled to support them once we know they have cured these deficiencies. And then, you know, I guess my final thing here is I too am worried about a form of equity. And that is, you know, some three years ago, I fought really hard for folks that are working with homeless women and children to get funding. And one of those organizations was being audited by the county, not us. They had a perfect record with us. The county was doing an audit and we did not give them any funding until that audit from the county came back clear. And they answered for whatever issues were still outstanding. I don't think it's fair to hold one group that's serving women and children to that standard and hold any other group that's actually being audited by us to a different standard. So I guess one of the things I would just like to direct staff, and it doesn't need to be part of the motion, it's really just a conversation piece is, what is going to be our policy? Because it's not fair to treat all these organizations differently. Jay's right, most nonprofits, especially the smaller ones or the ones that are growing from being small to being large, like Robertson, like that is a big challenge when you're a nonprofit. What are we doing to help them bridge that gap? Jay is right on the money, I think, with that piece and we need to do it. But I, I'm not gonna support a motion that is already agendizing an expenditure or asking the city manager to agendize an expenditure. I think that's premature. I understand council member Hansen's timeline. I really actually think that's noble of him. He's trying to take care of something here while, while he's got a chance. Good on him for that. However, we owe it in fiscal responsibility to this city to have Jorge come back and tell us where they are just as Jay has recommended, accept the audit, come back and show us how these folks are doing with their plan before we direct the city manager for an expenditure discussion. That's my position, Mayor. Thank you very much, Ms. Ashby. Um, uh, before I turn it, I know Councilman Hanson had a comment, but I, I wanna weigh in here and I, we wanna hear from the city manager as well. And, and I've talked a lot to the city manager about these issues over the course of the past several months. I'd like to try if I might, as mayor, to see if I can reconcile some of the seemingly contradictory, but I believe actually consistent messages coming from uh, every member of the city council on this item. And first of all, I would just say, relevant or not for me, um, I have known Daryl Roberts for 40 years. Uh, we were college interns together uh, back in Washington, DC, uh, back before either of us knew we would be uh, in any form of public or community life. And the man I knew then is the man I know now. And of course, his wife, Tina, as well. These people have hearts of gold. They do the Lord's work. They um, are out there uh, helping generations of kids and families in very, very profound ways. And we cannot lose their, uh, the benefit of their work. We cannot. And yes, there are many great nonprofits. Uh, they've been at it a long time and they have a demonstrated track record of success. I don't say however to that, but I do think that there are two messages here, here which are not contradictory we do have a responsibility to oversee the public dollar. We sure do. And those we grant the money to have a responsibility um, to act as fiduciaries for the public and the communities that they serve to make sure that the money is spent appropriately. And the audit here obviously 
raises some questions. I, I would, you know, put it under all under the category of of in the way Jay described it, the way others described it, um, a, an organization that does incredible work in the community, but its strongest suit is not the fiscal management of, of their nonprofit. So what do we do about that? I, I understand the impulse to say, well, let's not give them any more money until we're clear that they have um, fixed their books. But I think there's a better option here. And I, I think in the long run, it actually saves the uh, organization and other nonprofits if they were followed suit um, a lot more money with a lot less heartache. And that is to focus on Richard Dana's uh, testimony earlier in the role of the Sierra Health Foundation. We need, in this instance, an intermediary organization that has more capacity to be not just a loose partner with the Roberts Family Development Center, but to actually be the fiduciary, to actually be the fiscal agent, the fiscal sponsor. So that Howard Chan in his role as city manager, and he'll speak for himself in a moment, can, can comfortably say, yes, we are helping Roberts, but rather than have to worry about the same compliance issues over and over again, we actually hold Sierra responsible. And then it's their relationship with Roberts where the money gets transparently funneled to meet the to, to meet the public and community objective, which is to serve the families and to serve the kids. I think if we expect, even with these changes that RFTC has made, I'd rather them, just as me, spend less money and attention on that and go do what they do so well and have Sierra with the appropriate fee structure, because Sierra has to make its, has, has to meet its expenses too, handle everything else and to know that the manager and the council are actually contracting from a fiscal responsibility perspective with Sierra, not with RFDC. And I actually think it's a model that can work with other struggling nonprofits because a lot of the nonprofits need that intermediary organization that has the capacity that they do not have. Now, when it comes to Council Member Hansen's laudable motion on the issue of the remaining work on the on the structure and i've been out there and i do think if we can and i'm going to caveat it that we should find a way to contribute so that that project can be finished but two caveats number one i do think that it should go through sierra health foundation so that we're not having to wait months and to determine whether RTC is or is not, you know, met every single audit standard here that Jorge and his team appropriately pointed out. But the second thing, and this is to my friends at RFTC, Daryl and Tina, I think before we write a check, we need to know exactly and, and validate how much money is actually needed to fund the project, because that's part of the problem too sometimes, honestly, is that you know, what is actually needed is sometimes just less than precise. Um, and, you know, I know I've made calls, other members have made calls, you've gotten a lot of in-kind contribution from uh, the building trades and others, all wonderful. But the city, Angelique is right here too, you know, there's, we, well, number one, we don't even know if we have general fund money. Remember, Howard and the team and the city council we would like to let some of the CARES money to Roberts for some of the programming that was held up because of the audit. We cannot use CARES money for the building construction. We have to use general fund or measure U money. Now I'm all for it, but I also want to get that sales tax update and see if we have any money because we also owe Rick Jennings a uh, number of millions of dollars on the, on the waterfront and the levees. Thank you. I haven't forgotten. We owe, um, we have uh, more to pay to establish our Office of Community Response, which is a major uh, pu public safety reform issue. And there were several other things on the list. I wanna, I wanna help fund Roberts with general fund money to finish that construction. 
But Ranthi, don't just jam it on the agenda respectfully. You gotta know one, do we have money? Two, is the money gonna go, how, and how much is it precisely? And three, do we really have an ironclad deal with the Sierra Health Foundation about handling the money? We got all that, boom, I say a couple hundred grand, if we find it, let's get it to D and T and let's get the, and, and let's get the darn project done because um, it's great for the family, great for the kids. But let's take those steps and you know, let's do it right. That's my humble opinion. Uh, Steve, did you have another comment? Or I turned it over to Howard and then maybe- come Yeah, uh, I'll just be real quick right before Howard. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, one, fiscal intermediaries, um, fiscal agents for nonprofits is a very common thing for a lot of different reasons. Um, so that's not new. In my um, request for friendly amendment, it was to use the Sierra Health structure that the city manager recommended and vetted already, um, because I believe that has allowed um, uh, funding to pass already to RFDC consistent with some of the other programs. Um, it was one of your letters, uh, budget memos, Mayor, that assigned uh, a budget allocation from Measure U, and I, I'll defer to Council Member Warren, but I believe it was one of his requests that we help him with the building. And um, I believe that money is probably still being held. Howard can answer that. But we, we set an expectation, whether we call it a promise or an expectation. And um, we've put RFDC and uh, Downtown Streets team through a very rigorous process here. They've responded, they've already adapted and implemented many changes. And I'm very proud to see how robust that is. Um, and, and the real comment I wanted to make is that when our parks department had overtime violations, we didn't stop funding the parks department, we changed it so it worked better. When our fire department or police department have um, challenges raised fiscally by our audits, we implement changes. We don't stop funding them. And you know, through all this conversation about Measure U and equity and um, even the ballot measure situation surrounding us, our commitment to the most vulnerable is still one of the things that people are most in doubt about. Now, core services have to be maintained, but the, the, the obligations we've made, whether firm or not, and whether the money has been released or not, those are all different things, but we set an expectation that we're gonna help. And I hope that it's not a premeditated failure because you know we've certainly put Tina and Daryl and his organization and Downtown Streets team through the grinder. And to some extent, um, we need to let them find their, their way through some uh, reconciliation and through um, the hard work they've done to, to implement changes um, back into um, serving the community and focusing on that. So I, I just think it's important we not be hypocritical about how we conduct our business and single out any one entity in this process. I don't think, I, I'm just gonna say, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Nobody's being singled out here. I'll defend the Roberts to the very end. I love them. I want the money to go that way. But man, part of it's their responsibility and they know it. So don't- that, I, that, I'm not denying that. I'm no, not denying that. But yeah, sometimes we, we want to no, have it both and, ways. And nobody's holding back money, by the way. What happened was Measure U collapsed, as we know, once COVID hit. So. The minute we find that money, we got to do right by Rick Jennings again and some of the other promises that we made. I'm for I'm for I'm for finishing that project with the Roberts. Um, but we've got to. There's no plot here. This is all. <laughs> we all want to do the good and the right thing. City Manager Chen. Well, thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Hanson. Uh, and Councilmember Hanson, you're right. We have been funding RFTC through CARES Act money via Sierra Health. So that relationship exists. Here, here's the good news that I've been in preliminary discussions with Sierra Health Foundation ready to do exactly what the mayor and I've been talking about for some time now. And that is if we have our agreement with Sierra Health to deliver, whether it's Freedom Schools or to finish out this capital project uh, and they sub, if you will, with uh, RFDC to have those programs move forward and have the construction project completed, uh, all of my concerns relative to these audits are addressed. We could come back and look at this six months from now, which is typical 
for uh, Jorge to do. And if those things that have been put in place today uh, continue to, to be successful, then we can have a conversation about removing that intermediary. But at, at this point, that's probably going to be the, the best course of action moving forward. And I, I fully support it. And I will um, work with Sierra Health to make that happen if that's the will of the council. Okay. Mayor, uh, one brief comment. Yes, Vice Mayor. So I, I support that course of action, but that of course means that Sierra Health then should be under the auspice of our city auditor to just make sure that if they're the fiscal agent, that all of this is above board and appropriate, but more or less, but transparent, auditable. It's the way every fiscal organization should be. I think that's right. So just to be clear with Councilmember Hansen and his request, even if it's not part of the motion, I will work, um, uh, it, it's not part of the motion because I think you want Jeff Harris and Angelique Ashby's uh, unanimous vote on this, but I will tell you that my intent, and remember the mayor under the current charter can set, uh, put an item on the agenda, but I do so always in consultation with the city manager. We will work together to, to one, specify the amount of general fund or measure you money needed to finish the construction project and really talk about auditing, <laughs> we will fine chisel that and fine tune that. And then we have to identify whether or not we've got the money, either because of more optimistic sales tax numbers or whatever we get that indication. Because again, there are other promises that we have made as well that are waiting for that, um, for that financial evaluation as well. And then if I'm confident, if your manager's confident that we can go forward to help fill that gap, then I'm for it and we'll put it on the agenda. But I just wanna go through those steps expeditiously before we make that recommendation. You know, and, and one last thing I'll say is, uh, this is to Councilmember Chenier's comment, uh, yes, we need to do a better job of managing our grants citywide. And it's something that we have uh, been working on uh, long before these audits ever came to light here. And in fact, it was early in 2019 that we were working through coordinating all of our departments that issue grants and uh, we were managing them with desperate, uh, desperate systems. And, and so we've let out an RFP for an IT solution to do just that. Uh, we have a working team, interdepartmental working team to gauge what level of uh, requirements uh, will be uh, uh, put upon those grantees depending on dollar values. And, and all this will bring back along with how we uh, can expand the technical assistance to nonprofits uh, when we come back. But uh, I thought it's important to note that this is something that we are aware of, we've been working on, and we're pretty far down the road. So more to come in the report back. So if I can, Mayor, quickly. Yeah. One is I don't think there's anything inconsistent about the motion and direction as I said, I, I didn't put a date on when this should come back. I do think it deserves a, um, a discussion. I know that there were other projects that got caught up in Measure U. I'm sure they're on the phone already calling some of us. Um, so I, I do think we need to have the discussion. And if you have my commitment to have the discussion, if you can remove it from your motion, I think we'll have unanimity. If it stays in the motion, I'm worried that right. we're so All right, I, I'll remove it. And if Mr. Warren is okay with that. The other thing, I just a comment to the city manager. Um, I, I appreciate the work that's going on. Um, would love to get an update on it. I also want to make sure that from the nonprofit side, um, there are a lot of sophisticated nonprofits in the city who can who should be involved in that conversation of how we do that. Um, I don't know that the folks who work for the city have the understanding at all times, you know, we always want those impacted most to be part of the conversation. So I, I'd ask that you make sure that that happens as well in, in that work that you're doing, which I, I think is great. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, there are several people in the community that I've met with uh, in, in that regard. So yes, absolutely. And, and there's different models of doing it. So I think the, the models we use for small business, we did very expeditiously. There's other ways that we can do it. And, and I'd love to be part of that discussion. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'll, I'll amend the motion if Mr. Warren is okay as the second. Yeah, I have a, a question or two. One is uh, this, the timing of the evaluation uh, from Sierra Health or what you need from Sierra Health. Um, it was suggested that somehow we need to 
you know, either understand the arrangement and and subject them to some type of either audit or um, examination prior to. So is, is is that correct or am I incorrect? I, I think that uh, it will be a very short timeline because we do have a model in place working directly with Sierra Health. Uh, it is uh, just making sure that the relationship between RFDC and Sierra Health reflect um, the, the current arrangement they have with, I think it was with pop-ups and some other um, programs they were delivering under the auspices of uh, Sierra Health. That being the case, I, I, all my concerns uh, are, are addressed. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah I will, uh, uh, I'll second uh, the new motion. So let me, I, I wanna clarify, cause I, I Council Member Hansen and I are um, having a little bit of a text exchange about the solidity of, of my commitment to agendize the question of funding the uh, helping provide some funding to close the gap so that they can finish their construction problem uh, uh, project. First of all, conceptually from heart and head, I am all in favor of it. I wanna do this. Absolutely, we find a way and we always find a way. But in fairness, we have to do two things, three things. Number one is that very short term thing that Howard described a moment ago about solidifying the understanding with the Sierra Health Foundation, that's one. Number two, working with RFDC and the Sierra Health Foundation to understand the exact amount that they need because it, it they, they, they D and T are very good at getting a lot of. They get a lot of in kind support. They're good at it, and there's, and the, and so I want to know exactly what amount of money the city needs to put in to help finish it. And third, we just have to. We can't write a check for anything under Measure U that isn't that wasn't CARES eligible, by the way, because we took care of a lot of stuff through CARES without actually identifying that we have money. And so I just wanna do that. And remember, I'm the guy that likes to invest money in the community here. Um, I'm the one who has, has raised the inclusive economic development agenda here as the mayor of this city. So I'm for it, but we also have to have, just have to identify that we actually have the money. And so those three things, I would anticipate that we can do all of that within a couple of weeks. Why not? Why not? I'm not talking about delaying this uh, to delay it. I just want to make sure that we that, that we do it in, in the right way. So that I hope that's clarity, but that's the best I can do. Mayor, I'll just say one thing. Thank you for clarifying that. I think the goalpost had four wheels on it, and at least three of those wheels were removed. And, you know, I, I'm comfortable with your clarification um, and your commitment to move forward. Okay, thank you. The wheels are going to get put back on many buses here. Um, we're Just gonna, don't put them on the goalposts, that's we're gonna, all. Or, yeah, whatever, goalposts, buses, whatever it is, we're going we're gonna to recover and reinvest. So let's call the roll on, uh, on the motion, please. Thank you. Thank you. Before we call roll on that motion, can we take a step back and ask council member Jennings how he votes on temporarily suspending the council rules of procedure to bypass budget and audit committee? I vote yes. Thank you. And so on the second motion, approving the city auditor's contract compliance audits, um, the motion by council member Chenier and second by council member Warren, council member Ashby. Yes. Council member Warren. Yes. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Hansen? Aye. Councilmember Schneer? Aye. Councilmember Guetta? Aye. Councilmember Jennings? Aye. Councilmember Carr? Yes. And Mayor Steinberg? Aye. That's good work. That's unanimous from everyone, including the city auditor. Thank you very much for thorough and uh, painstaking work on both audits. Thank you to Roberts and and the street teams, thank you to the city council for engaging in real ways here and the city manager and your team. We all wanna do the right thing and I think we're heading in that direction. Okay, thank you all. Let's move on to the next item. That is, um, that is item 30, which is the uh, whole person care pilot, the only city 
other than the city and county of San Francisco that got this funding. I'll turn it over to Emily Halkin for a report and some decisions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and this will be brief, but uh, good, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. As you'll recall, on, in early September, we had our first conversation about the future of the Pathways to Health and Home program, our implementation of the state's whole person care pilot. Um, at that time, Council provided uh, policy direction to staff, and today is an interim step to get a more formal vote to allow us then to move forward with budgetary and contractual um, items that will need to come before you in the coming months. Um, so today what I have in front of you is a framework for funding plan for the Pathways program that will allow us to simultaneously develop service contracts for this January, so there's no break in service for the program, but also to begin negotiation of external contributions should the state receive um, an extension of the waiver as they have requested. Um, so as a reminder, on September 8th, we discussed three scenarios related to the whole person care pilot. One of them we have dismissed, which was to opt out of the program at the end of December. Um, as you will recall, um, the program is set to, to end this December, um, but is being considered for a one year extension request by the state. At this point, the state of California has submitted their formal request to the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the CMS has deemed that their application is complete. However, we have no expectation that we will receive any notification of movement on this extension until early next year, possibly as late as February or March. Given this, in September, the council directed staff to pursue this state extension, but also to create a locally funded backstop to allow for a ramp down during 2021 should the federal funding not be available. So today I have that framework for your review for both of the scenarios. And as I said, I expect to be back in December to seek budgetary approval and contract, contract approval to allow extension of service contracts. The two, um, after the, the meeting in September, staff worked to start the work on costing out estimates that will meet the council's direction. Um, the two scenarios in both cases, the two scenarios would both allow the Pathways program to continue in some semblance um, for 12 months, really intending to bridge the time between when the current uh, waiver ends and when the Cal AIM, which is the state's new implementation of a, of a similar type of program, is, is expected to start in January of 2022. Should the waiver extension be granted by the federal government, the city would pursue a similar approach to funding as the current program is funded. Uh, partnering up in, with our local health care systems and augmenting that funding with funds from the Homeless Services Division, as has been done since its inception. The second scenario, again, assumes 12-month timeline, but is entirely locally funded, using funds from the Whole Person Care Bonus Augmentation Funding that the mayor has helped to secure, plus some proceeds from what will be our final uh, trans uh, financial transaction with the federally funded portion of the program. Since September, since the September direction from Council, we have met with our Pathways partners on this approach and shared the input from Council. The partners who are inclusive of our service providers, all four health systems and all five managed care program partners, all strongly supported a 12 month local ramp down should the extension not be granted. Um, there's more complete input from the partners in attachment three to your staff report, but this slide shows the general input that we got from them, which really is focused in on ensuring cont continuity of care for the clients, ensuring that there's very clear timelines and access to transition services for our clients, and really focusing the last year on access to stable housing for many of our clients who remain homeless. We took these comments then to our executive committee um, last week and they concurred with those recommendations from our partners and directed staff to bring this to council today for final approval. Um, what's important to note is that regardless of the funding framework, we're sort of living between two options as we speak, the program is committed to continuing operations through the end of 2021 and not beginning to transition our clients off of services until we have a fully developed transition plan. The funding framework, which is also included as attachment to your staff report, has two scenarios. Um, given the likely delay in knowing anything about the federal waiver extension, staff recommends bringing budget actions and contracts in December using the locally funded option. 
Simultaneously, we will begin to negotiate with our external funding partners around extension of their existing funding commitments should we get the extension from the federal government. And we will also work to identify ways to fill any additional funding gaps um, in an in a extended program. We have been told by the state that if a federal extension is granted, even if it's delayed by a couple of months, that it would be a retroactive approval, meaning that any funds that we put out from January 1st until the time of the extension is granted, the city can recoup. So pending council's approval today of these funding approaches, um, staff will begin immediately working on extending service contracts through the first quarter of 2021, which is when we hope to have approval of the federal government of, of, of the extension. Uh, these contracts and the budget actions uh, related to the local $5 million uh, whole person care augmentation will come to council in December. Simultaneously, we'll begin working on securing funding in the case that we get the federal extension. So that all those pieces are in place once we get the go ahead from the federal government. Regardless of the funding approach, staff and the Pathways team will continue our work on a full transition plan for clients um, at the end of 2021 with the goal of continuity of care, housing stability, and ensuring they all have access to health care as priorities. Um, as we learn more about the waiver extension, we'll also be back with many more actions related to extension of our funding agreement with the state. This ends my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Do we have public, thank you, Emily, Ms. Halkin. Do we have uh, public testimony on this very important item? I have no callers on this item. Okay. May I make a motion in support uh, to move the item? So you're, you're moving, and, and the, just to clarify, the motion is for uh, option number one, correct? That we want to extend this for a full year. Scenario one? Yes. Yes. Excellent. That is the motion. Okay. Is there a Great job, Emily. Thank you. Is there, is there a second? A second, Mayor. This is Larry Carr. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Carr. I just want to say, if I don't see hands, that I want to thank Emily for her stewardship of this really important project. As you know, this one maybe sometimes gets a little lost in the shuffle, but remember this was one of our first uh, initiatives back in 2017 when um, our county chose not to apply and we chose to apply. And it has resulted now in tens of millions of dollars uh, coming to the city and more than that for the combat homelessness, but more significantly, these impressive numbers, you know, over 2,000 total enrollments, 912 people currently uh, enrolled in, in Pathways, 503 people permanently housed, 354 transitionally housed, almost 1,000 people. And uh, these are really vulnerable people. And the, the fact that we now get to continue this and coordinate it with some of our other initiatives, I think is really important. So Emily, just want to say thank you. I uh, haven't forgotten uh, why this is one of our signature uh, homeless initiatives here in Sacramento. Let's, let's, let's call the roll. Mayor Pro Tem Ashby. Yes. Council Member Warren. Yes. Vice Mayor Harris. Aye. Council Member Hansen. Aye. Council Member Chenier. Aye. Council Member Guetta. Aye. Council Member Jennings. Yes. Council Member Carr. Yes. And Mayor Steinberg. Aye. Okay, that concludes the afternoon's agenda. It's a special meeting, so we don't have public testimony on items not on the agenda. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? That's correct. Okay, what about council ideas and questions? Do we wait for the evening? Yes. Yes. We wait yes. for the evening meeting. That's what we will do. I know I have something, but I, I can wait for the evening. Um, we do have a closed session. At what time, Madam Clerk? So our next meeting is at three o'clock. It's the Personnel and Public Employees Committee. We have closed session that will start at 3.30 or as soon as the PNPE meeting is completed. And then we have a regular meeting at 5 p.m. Okay, so um, can I ask uh, Mindy, or, uh, can someone send us a text or an email for those of us not on PP&E so we know when to hook back in? Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, Mayor. That's okay. Um, or do we recess or adjourn? We adjourn. I knew that. Okay. 
We um, are adjourned until uh, five o'clock for a public session. Thank you so much, everybody.